recognizes the great inventor. One of the greatest proved, among other things, the relationship between matter and energy. This guy invented the telephone. She won the Nobel Prize for studies in radioactivity. The light bulb. Mass production. Bifocals. Temperature theories. Magnetic fields. Quantum theory. And the men who invented the airplane. But there is one man whose invention is used by you every single day, and yet you don't know his name. His invention is barely noticed. His invention saves thousands of lives every year. His invention saves billions of dollars in better farming and more efficient travel. His invention eliminated carpet bombing in wartime. And yet you've never heard of him. But wait, I've got even more. Without his invention, the internet would immediately collapse under its own weight. Without his invention, modern, worldwide, real-time banking transactions would be impossible. Without his invention, your cell phone would still be a big brick, and the number of people using them would be severely limited. Since the late 1950s, many attempted to invent it, and each got closer to a workable solution. But if it weren't for the talent and determination of Brad Parkinson and a hand-selected group of fellow Air Force officers and contractors, it never would have happened. So when did this happen? It was September 1973, Labor Day weekend as a matter of fact. The Pentagon's parking lot was virtually empty. They even turned off the air conditioning in the building. It was hot, humid, and dark. But the lights were on in the conference room on the fifth floor where Brad Parkinson and a dozen others sketched out the detailed design for an invention that you probably barely noticed. That meeting is now referred to as the Lonely Halls meeting. And their invention is the Global Positioning System. You know it as GPS. We would like to introduce you to these inventors. When was the first time someone thought a satellite could be used for navigation? It was Monday, October 7, 1957. That happened to be three days after Sputnik was launched. The kids were in school, mom was home, and dad was at work. The World Series would be on TV that night. But 6,000 miles away at a top secret launch site in what is now Kazakhstan, the Soviet Union was about to launch the world's first man-made satellite. It weighed 189 pounds and was about the size of a beach ball. They placed it atop their new secret R-7 Semyorka rocket. They launched it at 10.29 p.m., which was right around lunchtime on the East Coast. Once it was firmly established in orbit, they announced their success to the world. NBC, CBS, and ABC had plenty of time to get their news reports ready for the evening news. They put the U.S. on a virtual panic as no one suspected the Soviets were capable of achieving orbit. We didn't think they could make a decent refrigerator, much less beat us into space. But the panic wasn't that they had won the space race, but they had tested thermal nuclear weapons and could now easily target any city in the United States with little or no warning. They espoused worldwide domination. They had the bomb and now they could easily destroy us before anyone ever saw them coming. In order to prove their success, this closed society and secretive government published the orbital parameters and even the radio frequencies, so anyone could listen to its beeping sound as it passed over. They even polished Sputnik to a mirror finish so the sun could reflect off of it just after sunset so anyone could walk out and see it as it passed over.
So let's skip ahead to Monday. It was lunchtime at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. A 27-year-old man was in the employee cafeteria eating lunch and reading the newspaper about Sputnik. His name was Dr. Bill Geyer. He had a doctorate in theoretical physics and had done early computer modeling of hydrogen bomb effects for the government. His friend, George Weifenbach, joined him at the table. George was also in his late 20s, and he was equally brilliant. A Harvard undergrad who had just completed his dissertation for his PhD in microwave spectroscopy. George asks, Has anyone thought of recording the beeping sound as it passes over? It says here, it's being transmitted on the 20 megahertz band. Do you have a receiver for that? Of course I do. And that afternoon, as George was hanging a two-foot antenna out his window, Bill was calling the Naval Research Lab for the next flyover times. But Bill noticed right away a very pronounced Doppler effect. You all know what the Doppler effect is, that change in pitch when a car or a train or airplane goes by. That evening after dinner, Bill and George went back to the office. Bill brought his new tape recorder from home, and they hooked it up to George's radio. Ever the scientist, George was able to simultaneously pick up the transmission from the Bureau of Standards Radio Station, WWV, which was only 12 miles away in order to establish a standard frequency and time baseline. He overlaid the beeping with the baseline information. That's when Bill said, I think I can determine the orbital parameters of Sputnik based solely on its Doppler. He did, and it turned out to be incredibly accurate. Now remember, this wasn't official work, they were just messing around. In time, they let their bosses know what they had been up to. Their boss was Dr. Frank McClure. Now if you thought Bill and George were smart, the guy who Bill and George admired was Dr. McClure. Dr. McClure listened and looked at their data and equations and considered the ramifications of this new revelation. Orbit determination using only the Doppler effect. Dr. Bill Geyer later wrote, on Monday, March 17, 1958, Frank McClure called us into his office and asked us to close the door. Dr. McClure asked, if you know where the satellite is, can you invert the equations to determine where the observer is? In other words, could they use a satellite for navigation on Earth? It didn't take long for them to reply. Absolutely. The concept for satellite-based navigation, in other words, GPS, was born. But at that point, they didn't know just how tough the road ahead was going to be. Six twenty one B was a proposal to do a new navigation system using satellites. Dr. Yvonne Getting, who at the time was running Aerospace Corporation, when Brad was. Uh, first involved in the program, and he was a, just a super advocate going around and explaining to industry, to government all over what this thing would do. And I came into the GPS program about three to six months before it was called GPS. We struggled over names, but uh, it came out of an Air Force program called 621B. The program was known as 621B at the time. And in that process, uh, he recruited me and I came on board with him and uh, Colonel Parkinson, Dr. Parkinson. And that was sort of the uh, formulation of the uh, program office. 621B, which was, I think, originally designed to be a tactical solution for uh, navigation in Vietnam. Southeast Asia didn't have much in the way of waypoints. Uh, and out of that, the whole concept of, of a global system grew. The earliest report that, that 
Got Saved was written by Jim Woodford and Hideyoshi Nakamura, two aerospace guys. And uh, it laid out the basic parameters for what became GPS except for the orbits. A fellow named Howard Marks, who came to aerospace from Lingtemco Vaud, he was there about seven or eight years. He wrote one of the original reports that got destroyed on the GPS concept. And I think some of what Nakamura and Woodford wrote was drawn from the stuff that Howard Marks did. Woodford was just extraordinary. He was, he got his PhD from Lehigh, I think, when he was 20 years old or something. <laughs> just, just, he was really something. He was always ahead of everybody. Good guy. Nakamura was, he was a staff guy, kind of, to Woodford. He was a very, very nice person. You know, he was unfortunately interned in Nevada somewhere during the war. He's a Japanese name and off he went. Interesting story about Yosh. He, uh, we were on a business trip to uh, MIT Lincoln Labs back in uh, Boston. And he said, you know, Steve, <laughs> I remember a, a friend of mine, he was trying to get me to join his company. It was a startup company that he was trying to form. I said, no, no, I, I have a rock solid job with Aerospace Corporation. I'm not, I'm not gonna touch that. He says, my friend was the founder of Panasonic. <laughs> I remember he, he quizzed me about the concept when I just joined the program office and I answered all of his questions okay. He, did, he didn't get me fired. <laughs> In 1972, I was working on a program called ABREEZE at the Space and Missile Systems Organization in Los Angeles. And I got called in to the office of a certain Lieutenant General and said, how would I like to change jobs? Well, I was in a great job. I didn't want to change jobs. And after a bit of a conversation, he said, I'd like to assign you to a program that's been failing called 621B. General Schultz said, Brad, I want you to head up this program called 621B. <laughs> and Brad said, oh no, I have a great job. It was a great job. We had $300 million to play around with. And I said, uh, well, if you do, am I in charge? And he said, I can't guarantee that. I said, in that case, General, and this shocked him, I don't volunteer. The general said, Brad, you are the guy. <laughs> you don't understand, you are the guy. I no more than got out of the office and he reassigned me. Well, he knew I was looking for a job. He had already tried to hire me once, so it didn't take him very long to uh, hire me. I met Brad, by the way, at Stanford. We were both students at Stanford together. Brad and I had first met at MIT uh, when we were going to graduate school, and uh, we both moved to Holloman because they had base housing. <laughs> and uh, they lived two houses away from where. We used to drive every morning to work uh, together and really uh, got to know each other and got to know each other's capabilities and uh, it was fun to be there with them. Gaylord uh, joined us and Brad Parkinson and, and the other folks, the, a program called Avery's had wrapped up and so they became available and they, they joined, our, joined our team and of course took up the leadership of it. Brad was one of the smartest guys I've ever met and so uh, my concern about the lack of knowledge certainly evaporated immediately when Brad was going to be the program manager on the system. And uh, as I think about it now, I, I, I was groomed for this. All my life I was doing this. As a young man, I loved maps. I went to the Naval Academy, had two years of navigation, including Celestial, went to MIT, worked with Dr. Aper on inertial navigation, I had a three years testing inertial navigation, and I had been on AC-130 gunships as part of an introductory team. I appreciated the need for precision in the Air Force. I had taught astrodynamics, the 
uh, idea of how you, where a satellite goes and why it goes there, why it moves that way uh, at the Air Force Academy. So I had a background that seemed exquisitely tailored to this, but I wasn't certain what this program was going to do. So having been assigned it, we got into the details heavily immediately. And I was handed a certain design. And a few months later, I took the design forward to the Pentagon. You got quizzed by every staff officer and general in the uh, Air Force. And then occasionally they want to have a guest appearance at like the Army or Navy uh, hierarchy as well. And it was just a terrific uh, experience for a young officer to uh, see how the bureaucracy within the uh, military establishment uh, uh, worked. I failed. Thumbs down. Colonel Parkinson had come back from the Pentagon with the message, the egg beater constellation with three groups of four isn't going to go. We've been told no, come up with something else. Let's stop for a moment and make you an expert in astrodynamics. There are active and retired satellites along with booster rockets that got them here. You know, space junk. Most are in low Earth orbits like the space station and the Hubble Space Telescope. These average around 300 miles above ground and circle the Earth about every 90 minutes or 16 times a day. Further out in medium Earth orbit are where you will find the current GPS satellites. These circle the Earth around 12 hours or twice a day. Lastly, there's a ring of satellites around the equator. These circle the Earth once a day, obviously at the same rate the Earth rotates. These are called geostationary or geosynchronous orbits because they appear to be stationary to a person looking up from the ground. Now this is where the 621B satellites were intended to be placed. But having the satellites in a straight line at the equator introduces an accuracy issue called geometric dilution of precision. Now don't get stuck on the terminology, it's an easy concept to understand. Separating the satellites creates larger angles, essentially increasing the precision. The math does get a bit complex, but having satellites close together equates to marking a spot on a map with a large felt tip marker versus with a sharp pencil. But the satellites needed to stay over Southeast Asia, so their orbits had to remain geosynchronous. Well, they can incline the orbit, which has the effect of making the ground trace appear as a figure eight pattern every 24 hours. And that certainly helped. But it also meant Half the time the satellites were lowered on the horizon, which introduced other errors. So they decided to turn the circular orbits into ellipses, giving the satellites a little more hang time over the northern hemisphere, while at the same time spreading them out a little further. It was a workable solution, except for one thing, cost. This was not global navigation that could be used anywhere. It was a regional solution permanently limited to Southeast Asia. No, I can say it after all these years. The Air Force had a, a system based at geosynchronous altitude, clusters of satellites, and I thought, my God, the, the, company, the country can't afford something like this. But I had already developed a relationship, a mentoring relationship, with someone that I call the GPS godfather, and that was Dr. Mel Curry. Brad came into my office and presented the, the equations and the concept of global positioning system. And he said, Brad, I want you to go back, clean sheet of paper, redesign it. Come back with a new proposal and I think we, we, we will agree to it. So I canceled the Air Force program. See, we set this up as a uh, all service program. Brad at that time, I don't know whether he, he was even shaving at that time. He was, he was one of the youngest colonels I ever saw but I learned that he came from MIT and had a PhD. So he was probably a lot smarter than I was. And that led to a meeting that I called in the Pentagon over Labor Day in uh, 1973. And I just had Air Force officers, one Naval officer, and a few aerospace people. But basically the heart of GPS was 
Air Force technical officers who were absolutely superb. The GPS system we have today was created in a conference room on the fifth floor of the Pentagon, Labor Day weekend, 1973. The parking lot was empty, the lights were out, the air conditioning was off, and the room was stifling. Well, Labor Day weekend, they turned off the air conditioning to save power. Uh, the Pentagon didn't have a whole lot of money in those days. And, and so it was about 100 degrees up on the fifth floor where, where we spent the first day trying to document this thing. Brad found us a place down on about the second floor there the, the second day, so it was more, more humane. It was hot there where we were initially, and we did move. But the thing I remember more about that meeting from you know the peripheral issues was we were eating these stale hamburgers out of the fourth floor automat because it's the Labor Day weekend, nobody's doing anything with those machines because a lot of the workforce is gone, right? Not your best dining experience. The Navy was pushing for a um, uh, at one point, they were advocating an expansion of timation from, from uh, you know, the present 12 or 13 satellites up to 157 so that you could get four, at least four in view anywhere at any time. That was a, you needed a lot of satellites when they were only orbiting several hundred miles altitude. Four satellites. If you listen to four satellites, you can solve for where you are and also precise time. You don't need a precise clock in your user equipment. GPS computes your location using trilateration. It's not the same as triangulation, which uses angles. Trilateration uses distances. Since radio signals travel at a constant rate and since we know precisely where each satellite is and very precisely what time it is, all we need to do is measure the time it takes for the signal to get from the satellite to you. But it takes a very accurate clock because even just a few nanoseconds of error results in big navigation errors. Fortunately, each satellite has three atomic clocks on board and its time is tweaked on a regular basis from ground station uplinks. Each satellite continuously sends out messages one way. Your phone doesn't transmit back to them and that's why it's considered a passive system. These messages contain the satellite's identification, the time the transmissions are sent, and their current locations in space. Your phone does all the math. First, it computes the distance to a satellite based on the incoming message. By the way, that message was filtered from all of the other incoming messages from all of the other satellites in view via CDMA encoding, which will be discussed shortly. At this point, you know you're somewhere on the surface of a sphere around that satellite at a radius of the computed distance. Now, let's compute the distance you are from another satellite, which puts you on the surface of yet another sphere. Notice that the two spheres intersect in a perfect circle. At this point, we know you are somewhere along the edge of that circle. If we compute the distance from a third satellite, it narrows you down to two points. Then it's just a simple task of computing the distance from a fourth satellite to choose which of the two locations is the proper one. That's why you need a minimum of four satellites. And so we heard today about the, the, the 12 study that Nakamura and Woodford did. I don't think I'd ever heard about that until long after I left. The idea was to pursue option 12, even though I didn't know it was option 12. And the question is, what all do we have to do to develop a picture of how we're going to do it? So that's why we all went to the Pentagon. Bob Renard and the Mel Birnbaum and myself had gone up to talk to the NRL guys, the Navy guys, Roger Easton and company, about two weeks before the Pentagon meeting, uh, arm wrestling with them on negotiating on sort of what this new system should look like. And, uh, and, and I, I'm, I sort of walked away from that meeting in my, in my mind, pretty well fixed what we needed to do. And then it was just a case of getting everyone else to agree with me. <laughs> Which, in the Pentagon meeting, there were a lot of guys arguing, no, no, Val Denninger in particular, he wanted these low altitude satellites. And uh, you knew you had to make the satellites last a long time, otherwise 
24 satellites you can afford them. As a matter of fact, that was the problem with the Soviet GLONASS constellation. Their satellites lasted six months. Well, you want to support 24 satellites, your satellites last six months, and it takes you a month to sort of make a transition. You're launching 48 satellites a year. My philosophy was electrons don't wear out electronics. So if you properly design your electronics, the electrons aren't going to wear them out. So, so then, uh, then you, they should last forever. And, uh, and uh, so that's what we did. And I remember telling Brad that, that these satellites are going to last a long time because we made sure that, uh, that we did the right things on the satellite. They had to somehow put the expensive atomic clocks in orbit versus on each receiver, and they already knew it was going to be a tough problem to solve. Well, atomic clocks have been around for a long time. No big deal. Yeah, big deal. Why? Because we were flying in an intense radiation belt, and it would fry any normal electronics. The Navy tried to do this and were unsuccessful. Mel Burmont was going to go, but he had some kind of family issue and he couldn't go. I was new to the program, and I was you know, immersed in what, ben, in what Mel's ideas were for about three days before I left and went back there. The GPS system we have today is almost identical to the one laid out that holiday weekend back in 1973. But the most important decision was that the system had to be completely passive. That would allow an infinite number of users. And passive means affordable. Developing the satellites, developing the control, developing the whole GPS system with the same budget that we had for for, for a test program. And uh, so, uh, so money was always an issue in the program. We wound up doing a lot of discussion about, well, what about the ground segment? What about the satellite? What about the user equipment? And what do we, what do we know before that will carry over? And what didn't we know that's different that we ought to really think about? One of the critical decisions was determining the number of satellites required for accurate global coverage. Higher was better because it took, required fewer satellites. And uh, 18 hours was my favorite, but uh, you couldn't do 18 hours because the booster wouldn't handle it. Eight hours was okay because it was lower, but then it would require a lot more satellites for an operational system. And so 12 hours was, the, uh, was where we ended up with. Given that four satellites had to be in view at any time, and given they were placed in a 12,000 mile high orbit, they knew they needed a minimum of 24 satellites to make it all work. But somehow they needed to talk to each satellite without using 24 discrete frequency. Imagine 24 people in a circle all around you trying to talk to you at the same time. Code division multiple access. That means that all the satellites are broadcasting on an individual code and they're all on the same frequency. From the outset, the GPS team were designing a system aimed at simplicity and low cost for the user. Their solution was CDMA. But the orbit is not a stationary orbit like some of the communication satellites, but orbits that are moving rapidly at, at a medium altitude. The, the fact that the, the satellites are operating at these velocities, it causes a, uh, a perturbation to the signal and that they uh, all have a very substantial Doppler shift. That Doppler shift changes the, the mathematics that you have to have to, honor, to optimize the, uh, the signal, the CDMA signal codes. I had to, to, to perform those mathematical calculations uh, using Stanford University uh, high, high speed uh, computers. We were kind of worrying about the budget, but as you heard today as well, there wasn't any elasticity there either. 
So, you know, it was kind of a, an interesting meeting in that we formed a lot of good ideas. But a lot of good things came out of that, and we then started working towards formalizing them in specifications, interface control drawings as the year, as the year progressed so that we had enough of a good picture by December that we went through that DSARC-1 thing that actually got the program sold to where it got funded and we could proceed. Fast forward, December 1973, we proposed a system. The heart of it was a new signal structure called CDMA. CDMA solved that problem. It was genius. CDMA, now it's used by Qualcomm and many other people, but in 1973, it was not just revolutionary, it wasn't even accepted as a way to do it. Well, the clock was the big one. It was getting it uh, the accuracy that was going to be needed in order to uh, have the user equipment work and then to get the signal down uh, from the satellites. Now, GPS equals the clock. The clock equals GPS. The tricky part we knew was going to be the clock. The biggest problem on the, on the, sa on the satellite was uh, the clock, of course. So we found a German clockmaker who had offices in Munich, Germany, and Costa Mesa, California. And he had a rubidium frequency standard. And we teamed him with our electronics people at Rockwell Aeronautics. I, uh, right from the beginning, started working on rubidium vapor atomic oscillators. And uh, I personally didn't invent anything, but, but I figured out how to get the inventor to do all the right things. And they packaged it such it would survive in space. Atomic clock, a small atomic clock, is just as much of as a, as a world changer than, than GPS is because well, uh, the laboratory device that did timing uh, were about the size of a big microwave. And Ernst Jäscher in Munich worked for Roden Schwartz, and in late 60s he uh, took that large development item which was like a 19 inch rack, foot high, and he made a 4 inch by 4 inch by 4 inch atomic oscillator at the same specs. I remember the man real well, Ernst Jäger was his name. He was an absolute genius. And geniuses work when geniuses work, and he worked, his day was from 12 noon till midnight. So I always met with him at night, like seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. And it was always kind of interesting. At about nine o'clock at night, his wife would bring around German white wine and cookies, you know, to, to, to feed the crew working there. And he took me out into his lab one night, and the rubidium cell is about as big as my little finger and it's filled with a gas that has kind of a rusty color and he's out there and he's got a whole bunch of them on his workbench and he picks one up and looks at it, puts it over here, picks the next one up and he says, that's good, and picks the next one up put it. and he's sorting them and I said, Ernst, what are you looking at? And with his nice little German accent he says to me, Dick, only I know what I'm looking at. So we developed the clock uh, with his basic uh, physics package and we wrapped around it a, a radiation hardened package. The technology of miniaturizing these large uh, atomic clocks down to something that would be put on a satellite it was a very uh, critical element in the uh, design of the system. Jim Spilker used to be in my office every day wanting more power, you know, because you go do this the first time and you're lighting up the earth with a 100 watt light bulb <laughs> from 11,000 miles away, there's not a whole lot of power in the signal. We're trying to design so, so that we can have uh, millions and millions and even billions of users around the earth in all continents. And, and if the signals don't get transmitted correctly with the right amount of power in the right signals, the system will not work. So I have an enormous responsibility to make sure that the signals that we transmit down to the users on Earth are the best signals we can possibly generate. So he'd come in and I'd say, Jim, 
We're not on the Atlas booster anymore. We have no money. We have no program. <laughs> so he would come in, well, it might rain. It might snow. It might whatever. And uh, so uh, that caused us to, the satellite, the space segment, guaranteed the power on the ground. And most specifications are that you do the satellite is the radiated power of the satellite. In our case, we did power on the ground. On the satellite, we had tremendous challenges because the Air Force wanted to launch everything with uh, uh, Atlas Fs. And the throw weight Atlas F was like 1,450 pounds. That means that the satellite weighs about 850, and then you have a 500 pound aperture kick motor, so you go from a perigee of 70 miles from the Atlas uh, to uh, kick, the, kick the motor, then uh, when it's at uh, apogee, and then circularize it. And uh, so you can imagine uh, the challenges because at that time, uh, uh, 850 pounds, you know, it was, was a really ch tremendous problem. Alan Love came up with a way of, of making the signal so that it has less power in the center than on the edges. And so he made a 12 helix array, which is still being used by just about everybody in the world, including uh, Galileo and uh, put the extra 3 dB in the 5 degree horizon, so now you, ha you, you saved all that power. And that was interesting because it gave a trade to, to Rockwell where they, they put more power on the edge of Earth and less power over the center of the Earth that saved 3 dB, it saved 3 dB in the satellite, which allowed them to shrink down the size of the satellite. And, uh, and uh, but we did that because we specified power on the ground. I guaranteed the Jim Spilker and the user guys that you would get this much power. We wrote our incentives on the contract around that. Uh, I learned very quickly during the proposal phase uh, how that we were going to be successful because everybody else had like an 800 uh, watt solar array and we had a 500 watt solar array. And I began to realize that, you know, they were just not with it. They didn't have a lot of good innovative people. Uh, to think of this, which was, was paramount to save something like, I don't know, at least 100 watts on solar rays. It's truly incredible that a group of men could create this kind of accuracy from an orbit that's 12,000 miles up. Einstein said there was something called general relativity which reflects where, how deep you are in the gravity well, and that affects the frequency of the clock. And he also said if you're going fast, the clock slows down. So it turns out both of those effects are not only slightly important, they are massively important. Einstein's theories of relativity have a massive effect on the accuracy of GPS. General relativity states that time runs differently for observers at differing heights in a gravitational field. Relativistic effects increase as the orbital height increases, as shown in red, following this equation. At their orbital altitude, GPS satellite time speeds up by 5.3 times 10 to the negative 10th. For special relativity, time runs differently for observers in relative motion. Relativistic effects increase as the relative speeds grow, shown in blue, following this equation. At an orbital altitude of 10,898 nautical miles, time slows down by 0.83 times 10 to the negative 10th relative to the observer. Add them together and the net total relativistic effect on GPS clocks in orbit, shown as the green line, equates to an error of about 38.6 microseconds per day. It doesn't seem like much, but if we did not correct for Einstein's theories, our GPS location would drift by about 6.2 miles each and every day. But there is a simple and elegant solution. Before launch, they slow down the GPS's atomic clocks from precisely 10.23 megahertz to 10.229-999-994-330 megahertz. The clocks are stable to a certain level of accuracy. These effects are a thousand times greater than that. And if you didn't adjust for that, you'd have a problem. But wait a minute. We gotta predict where this satellite is gonna be, and it's going around the Earth 90,000 miles 
and at the end of that, we still have two feet of accuracy? There are complications. The Earth's spin axis is not in the same direction in the Earth. It wiggles around with something called the Chandler Wobble. It's got perhaps an amplitude of 100 feet all by itself and a random period of around 400 days. You better account for that. You better account for the fact that as the signal comes down, it goes through free electrons in the ionosphere, which delay that signal, but it's variable. How do we fix that? Either with a model or we use two frequencies and actually calibrate what that error is. The, uh, the number of complications in gaining the accuracy that we do is enormous. I could go on and on, but I, not to belabor the point, but a lot of care and feeding go into that accuracy. And the interesting thing is, it's not simply the measured accuracy. It's the prediction forward that is the real challenge. The GPS program is a perfect example of a well-managed project. It was innovative, cutting-edge engineering managed under severe budget and scheduling constraints. There was a dedicated team in the Air Force, a dedicated team at Aerospace, and a dedicated team at Rockwell. And I think they were all stocked or filled with extremely capable people who were non-political, non-argumentative, and their only interest was to get up a satellite in orbit and prove that you could navigate from space. And that superseded all other desires. The government put together a really good team, extremely bright, uh, extremely qualified Air Force officers, Rockwell International team, um, Dick Schwartz and that team was really qualified. And then uh, Aerospace was able to put together a good team also. And I think that one of the things that uh, probably really stands out, the team aspect of uh, the whole program office. I said, you know, when we got the program, the people at Rockwell came to me and said, well, you have a big meeting like this with the customers, you gotta supply coffee and donuts. I said, they got me on a fixed price incentive contract. I'll provide the coffee, the donuts is on them. They gotta bring it themselves. <laughs> I'm not paying on my contract for donuts. <laughs> Dick had a Monday morning meeting with all of his direct reports. My technique was to have a program status meeting every Monday morning at 8.30. It would end at 11 o'clock. Whether we were finished or not, it would end, so we wouldn't take the whole day. It was a private meeting to kind of review where they were, what was coming up during the week, and where they were going, and any problems they had. And then the Air Force used to come in around lunch hour, and I spent the whole afternoon telling them what I had. And uh, they would sit and go over the same stuff. But I'd get to the end of Monday, and I'd say, I haven't done anything but status the program. I haven't done any work. So Dick invited uh, Aerospace and the government team to come and join his Monday morning uh, round table that he had. But there's only one condition if you join our meeting, you cannot speak. The aerospace guys and the government guys had to sit there like flies on the wall and not say a thing and not interrupt his meeting. My meeting, you can listen, and then after the meeting's over, you can come to my office and tell me anything you want. If you're happy or sad or mad, that's the time to do it, but you cannot interrupt my meeting. But we passed a lot of information along that didn't need to be repeated. And it really worked. It was a wonderful way for us to get to know all the key guys at, at Rockwell, and it was a wonderful way for them to get to know the key guys at the uh, government and the aerospace team. The resistance from the, the armed services to GPS was huge because they had, they had systems that they were happy with like um, TACN or Loran or VOR or inertial. You know, inertial, you know, and they were happy with them. The primary blowback I heard was from the Air Force and Fort Worth and the F-16 program. 
they hated GPS because they did bombing with radar bombing and nobody could take over. Unreliable, it would be jammed, it would be spoofed, and they couldn't rely on it. So they would not put GPS on the airplane for a long, long time. And we try to make the point, look, you know, these things are all relative systems. They're all relative to something, you know, a mountaintop or a runway or a VOR station or whatever. You know, we're talking about, you know, an absolute navigation system with the origin at the center of the earth. And from there, latitude, longitude, altitude, uh, you get it, you know, anywhere in the world, 24 hours a day, you know. And, but, the, you know, it's hard to get people to change. And, and uh, oh, we're happy with VOR. We're happy with TAC in. I'd say, oh, my gosh. You know. Convincing the Air Force and convincing uh, the funding people that it was going to be that big was, was a real challenge. Since Brad was very busy running the program back out in Los Angeles and trying to get our act together on that, Steve Gilbert, who was his deputy, was all over the East Coast, not just marketing GPS, but explaining why it needed to be funded, why it needed to be part of not just the Air Force budget, but the OSD budget and the President's budget. The operational Air Force didn't want it. The defense budget was tight and GPS was very low on the priority list. They fought for every dollar and used whatever equipment they could to keep the program alive. Uh, we, we got these boosters out of the wheat fields of Kansas, uh, old Atlas boosters that were retreads that didn't cost us very much. We uh, built our own stage vehicle uh, to boost us into uh, from the low earth orbit that Atlas put you in to kick us around and then we put the Apache kick motor on the satellite to circularize, uh, to circularize it. And with that combination, we were then able to do it at very low cost. We're trying to design a constellation of satellites such that you can see at least four all the time. And they have to be scattered across the sky all the time. So I went back to my office and I got out my big oversized quad pad sheets, four times as big as a sheet of paper. And I got out my colored marking pens and my colored pencils and started sketching it up. And within three days, I had covered 13 of these sheets with mathematics and geometrical sketches and drawings. And I had solved the problem from my viewpoint, verifying that this was the best constellation. I think, if I remember right, from contract award to launch, which was a little over 40 months, I think there were two changes on the satellite. Everything else stayed the same. The Air Force specs stayed the same. And if you could pluck those satellites out of orbit right now, they would look and look at the proposal, look at that cover of Aviation Week, they would look just like that. I spent two years at the LA at the program office, basically preparing for testing at Yuma Proving Ground. The decision had been made to test at uh, YPG, and it was my job to get them ready to test GPS. We did it in Yuma, and we did it, uh, there was a couple of other places that we did as well, but Yuma was our principal testing ground, and that's where we dropped the bombs and showed that you could uh, put five bombs in the same hole. The Navy had been attempting to develop its own satellite-based navigation system, focusing more on delivering time to the global fleet. It was called Timation, and was headed by Roger Easton at the Naval Research Lab. But the program had been canceled by Dr. Curry in favor of the joint, more robust system that was laid out at the Lonely Halls meeting. Two Navy satellites had been nearing completion. These were modified and adapted for proof of concept testing. While Rockwell worked on the first block of completely passive Rubidium standard GPS satellites with the CDMA signal structure. These two Navy satellites, NTS-1 and NTS-2, provided interim tests that could be performed while they awaited completion of the first true GPS satellites. Uh, first, we had the two uh, NRO satellites, NTS-1 and, and NTS-2, and then we had the ground transmitters, and then we launched you know, Navstar 1 and 2. No one had any idea that th this was going to be usable, and so it that was the principal part of the test program that we put together and that worked out very well. We could set the mission control and watch 
the real-time differences between the lasers and the GPS. Uh, the YPG guy would fly them around the range in a racetrack, so the lasers would track the retro. We had one on the top, one on the bottom, because he was banking a lot. And of course, the Jeep, when we were doing navigating on the inverted range, the GPS antenna was on the bottom. So there was a lot of mathematics that had to go on in real time to difference the GPS solution with the laser solution. So aerospace got involved in that. Post-flight analysis in real time, you know. He says, you can't do that. He says, well, we think we can. Bet you a case of beer, you know. So, well, he got his cases of beer. <laughs> Bill Feast, Joe Clifford were great people. Technical people that uh, they were responsible for a lot, developing a lot of the algorithms and software that UYPG are used. But uh, looking at the plots after the, the flight, <laughs> and the, one of the guys from Yuma that was uh, doing the plot, um, somehow we had talked about 13 uh, feet accuracy, and he says, 13 clicks, yeah. <laughs> the initial first flight of a GPS unit, and that was with an old 66 model UH-1 Army helicopter that had been heavily modified by Sergeant First Class George Rash. Uh, they literally took a F-104 400 cycle generator and put that in that helicopter because we needed 400 cycle power, and helicopters are 28 volts, sorry. Uh, so it had a special Dash 1 to be able to fly this thing. Uh, we had to train our Army pilots on how to set it, otherwise they would dump our 400 cycle and we'd lose our test equipment uh, and operations on that. So it was a, it was a pleasure uh, to work with George Rash and, and the airfield team. By 1978, February, I was launch commander on the first launch. Before we launched, I used to have a meeting with them. We were all ready to go and that kind of stuff. And I'd say at the beginning of the meeting, this meeting is not about money. It is not about schedule. It's about, are you ready to launch? Because we're launching our reputation. We're launching the ability of this system to work. So if you got anything to say, say it now. You know, if it's launched, fine. If it's not, say it now and we'll take care of it. And that was a way to put the responsibility on them. And they felt it and they, they enjoyed it. But that was a, kind of a little seance almost that we had. Are we ready to go? It's us flying. Because once we kiss it goodbye, we're never going to see it again. You know, that kind of stuff. We're never going to touch it. The command and control of the satellite to put it in the right orbit and to maintain the health was done at Sunnyvale. So I had the little detachment, four of us. Uh, we actually did all the procedures and everything. When we launched the first GPS satellite, uh, we had a problem acquiring the Earth. Uh, we got it up in orbit, the launch was flawless, and we were moving it into its final position. The booster put us in a big elliptical orbit, and our job was to get to the top of that orbit and then we had a motor in the satellite that fired that circularized the motor. So we had to know uh, how to do that. We knew the orbital parameters and in those days uh, the Air Force did the uh, calculation of the orbits and the, that kind of stuff. But our guy in those days we equipped him with a handheld computer which was the size of a briefcase and he used to do the check of the orbits then and we'd do any adjusting. And we were the ones who had, we obviously, we deployed the wings on the satellites and we had to acquire the Earth. The clock was ticking and the uh, panels, we had to deploy the panels, we had to spin the satellite up, and face the satellite kind of toward the sun, right? In order to get the, uh, the sunlight on that. And we, you know, it's inertial space, so no one could know exactly where the satellite was facing. So it, it was really a challenging thing. About eight months before we launched the first satellite, and this was another trick that we had learned from the NRO, is to do uh, what we called hardware in the loop 
testing. So we got some old attitude control and acquisition sensors, uh, and we cobbled together the, the hardware, and then we ran the software through that. And so we had done, we had a little laboratory where we had done that. And uh, I don't think Brad was for that because, you know, our budget was tight. He wanted us to do other stuff. Uh, I don't think I'm telling anything out of turn here, but, um, but I said, no, we, we got to keep that going. So we did. And uh, so sure enough, when we launched the first GPS satellite, <clears throat> we had problems with acquisition. So that's always a critical time because you're on battery power until you acquire the earth and then you get stabilized, then you can turn, you can unfold the solar arrays and start getting some power. But if you don't acquire, you can't, you just lose it. First acquisition on the first satellite, our guy who led the attitude control system, we went up to Sunnyvale, which was the first control center, that the blue cube up there. And we launched the satellite, we jump in the car and we race up to Sunnyvale. Right, Dick came up, Dick Schwartz was a Rocco guy, he came up. We had more visibility, you know what to do with it. And so we're deploying it, and uh, he's on his console there, and I'm leaning right on his shoulder looking at it, and the, the satellite's oscillating, and it gets smaller and smaller, and there's the Earth. And he turns to me and says, piece of cake, Dick. And what it had was what they call a plume effect. The solar panels were low, and when the thrusters fired, the thrusters got over the solar panel. It's like a jet, and it oscillated the spacecraft and the spacecraft started to tumble. He turns around and oscillates right off the thing. A lot of Rocco guys, a lot of guys from uh, the program office came up. We were able then to patch, because we already had this laboratory up and going, we were able to patch uh, some software things together, try it out in the laboratory, found it worked, you know, shipped it up to uh, the Blue Cube in uh, Sunnyvale, put it on and Voila, we acquire. That, that was kind of a really scary moment. But he says, I will never say a piece of cake again. <laughs> so the limited constellation, zero to start out with, won a Navy transit satellite, and then finally, we would, one by one, we'd get a GPS satellite in orbit. Um, and that satellite constellation would move, of course, and we'd have a moving window in which to test. Uh, I think we moved two hours earlier per week, something like that. It was a ridiculous schedule. Because the Earth doesn't rotate 360 degrees, it only rotates 359 days because it's going around the sun, or 359 degrees, that, that when you have flying satellites, the, over Yuma is your test area, it changes four and a half minutes every day. Well, you get ready to launch the first satellite, you're gonna fix the constellation, you want to make sure it's a total success. So 10 o'clock in the morning is a good time. March is a good time. And that's when we launched the first satellite. Because they're asynchronous, uh, they would come over once a day. And uh, we, would, we would see them. And our window would move two hours earlier uh, every, every week. And so the work schedule had to get tied to that. Well, it turned out that froze us testing in Yuma in the summertime and the daytime, and the wintertime and the nighttime. And the testers there in Yuma always complained to me, why couldn't you have done it just the opposite? <laughs> I said, well, that was not in our launch criteria for the first satellite. We hadn't thought of that. Over a uh, one year period, we would move through the daylight and night about 24 hours. So half the time we were testing at night. <laughs> and. Uh, that was fine. Uh, all I had to do was get the report ready for the next morning. Oh, well, the testers mentioned that all the time about that. <laughs> I mean, it was 120 degrees. They had to use uh, CO2, they had to use dry ice to keep the electronics cool enough to run some of their tests there. <laughs> there were people who didn't believe our results. So he said, you know what, Joe? We need a doubter's chair. <laughs> I said, what's that, sir? He says, put a chair right next to the target and, and, and 
mark it with a doubter's chair and tell them if you don't believe this, come sit in the chair and watch us drop these bombs. <laughs> so that's what I did. Uh, there's this huge sign, you can see it from the air, doubter's chair, and there's a chair and there's the, the post which we had blown the smithereen several times, had to keep replacing, replacing the post. The one thing that I really remember is when we were doing uh, a demonstration for the FAA folks, and uh, they wanted to see the possibility of how this would work on a, at that time, a 727 was a very popular airplane. The 727 can climb at 35 degrees, nose up. That's kind of noise abatement to get out of there. Well, a 141 doesn't climb at 35 degrees. Uh, but we wanted to get it as nose high as we could, so the test was designed in a kind of a racetrack, more like a roller coaster. I think we went to, to 15,000 feet and then we dropped to 5,000 feet and then pull up and get as steep as we could to head back up to 15,000. And uh, we were out there for about two hours, but sitting in the palleted areas in the back of the airplane, you really had no external reference other than, boy, this is a ride that really turns you green. And so I had an opportunity to get out of the pallet and go up to the cockpit and uh, just try to get my visual references. And at that time, the pilot got up and he said, I've, you can sit in my chair, don't touch anything, but uh, the co-pilot's going to fly and uh, I've got to go back and check some things out. And so I sat in there watching it and uh, we would do this kind of diving down, diving down, get the speed all up, and then at the bottom, pull it up and a co-pilot saying, and about now we're going to start stalling and everything would start shaking and then it would try to lean to one side and we'd pull it out. I don't know what angle we got on it, but our uh, FAA guy was, hey, this will probably, you know, the concern was uh, antenna blockage and distorting it. So that, I guess, my 141 experience, uh, that's one that really sticks with me because the pilot came back and said, hey, Lieutenant, Get in the back, I'm getting sick. <laughs>
candy bar out of the candy machine and just keep the crowd just, oh man, is this ever gonna end? <laughs> but he knew his stuff. I'm starting to realize, I think, this is the way the Air Force works from 8 in the morning till 2.30 in the morning, this is normal? I can't do this. And Mel was looking through the specs of the fourth contract, the weakest one, and he had a few paper clips on pages, and we, we, we a couple of us looked at him and noticed he was on page like 40 of 400 or whatever, and he'd flip through a page and clip it, and another page and clip it. Finally, he just started clipping pages because he was running out of time, and one of us looked at him and said, Mel, what are you doing? He said, well, you know, I put a paper clip to remind me to ask a question there. I said, well, you've got paper clips on almost every page, and you, you haven't even gotten to some of those. He said, well, when the meeting starts, we're going to have a little bit of time. I'll find something on that page. And he did. He was in charge of the NAV message and accuracy in general. So several software languages, and he knew them all. And he also had a very good knack at sizing computer requirements for processing speed and memory and so forth. He was a perfectionist, very smart guy. Mel Birnbaum of the Air Force, and I think Bert Glazer, who was from Magnavox, helped design the codes. That was my first week in the Air Force, working for Mel Birnbaum. Just, he wouldn't take a break. That was Mel Birnbaum. he just keep going, and the contractors were just dropping like flies. Review this, read you know, it, what about this? What did he about these numbers? And Mel was just that kind of an engineer. And I used to, whenever these guys would meet, I'd like to go sit in on part of the meeting to show them I was interested. I'd go to their meetings, and these were the smartest guys I've ever seen, and I think I personally understood every third word they were saying, but they were in it, and the code today on the GPS satellite is the same code they developed then, so it's whatever, what's that, 40 years, it's still the test of time. So I keep trying to live up to that challenge that Mel had given me, and that's, I'm, I'm not there yet. I think he's passed away, but uh, he was a super talent. was a brilliant engineer. And we put a post in the ground, and of course that was a GPS location that was uh, in the G GPS uh, receiver on board. We'd come in and we'd, uh, GPS would tell them when to release their sand-filled bombs. And we had modeled the trajectory right on the target, time and time again. And now, people take it for granted. And you say, wow, how did that happen? Even though GPS had proven more successful than anyone had ever imagined, the GPS program was always tenuous at best. As such, civilian companies were largely unwilling to bet on designing equipment for a system that might be shut down at any moment due to military budget constraints. Well, we had sort of envisioned it was going to be a big thing. Uh, we had to envision this. Uh, and I know when I came back, you know, I took, took over the program again in 85. To, pro to manage it, and I was disappointed how they had lost their, the fire. I mean, we all had fire and, and uh, resolve on how big this program was going to be, and it was just sort of another space program by then. And so I worked hard to try and recreate the fire in people to go uh, make it happen again. A few major events happened that solidified the future of GPS. First happened 35 years ago at the height of the Cold War when the Flight 007 tragedy occurred. In the days that followed, President Ronald Reagan declared that the GPS system would never be canceled. This clearly signaled to civilian manufacturers a go-ahead to design and create GPS receivers for use in civilian aircraft. With the stroke of a pen, any doubt was eliminated. The military proved the value of GPS during the first Gulf War, but it didn't happen the way you'd think it did. A lot of the guys that were over there, this is just regular 
troops guys, enlisted guys, they wrote home to their moms and dads and said, you know, everything looks the same here in the desert. There's no points. And they said, if you could just go down to the local Marine store and buy a GPS and send it over to us, that would be so great. Well, they started doing that. And their moms and dads sent them over there by the hundreds first and then the thousands. And so until that time, uh, the Defense Department was at, the, they were trying to fill in the requirements to get GPS over there, but they, they had trouble integrating it into all the vehicles. And they were, the cost was still really high. So the moms and dads started sending these marine, uh, civil, recreational GPSs over there. And um, the helicopter pilots were taping them, you know, to their cockpit sides, and and the tanks were running a big wire out of the uh, turret up on top the door, uh, maybe uh, 50 yards or so in the sand behind them, and so they were using everybody was using GPS, and they finally got overrun and flooded by these, and then the DOD started buying them by the hundreds and thousands and shipping them over there. Also back then, GPS satellites were transmitting two signals, a highly accurate military one and a civilian signal that was quite a bit less accurate. Obviously, the United States didn't want to give our enemies the same capabilities as our own military. But even at an accuracy of less than 100 yards was groundbreaking to the civilian market. But the industry wanted even more accuracy. Guy calls me up and then he says, uh, Commander? And I said, well, actually it's only a lieutenant commander. He says, well, he says, my name is so-and-so. I'm the director of operations for Mobile Oil. I said, yes, sir. He, he says, uh, here's my problem. He said, you know, he said, we'll be um, drilling for uh, oil off the coast of Africa. He said, I've got drilling ships out there and we'll put down a million dollars of pipe into the seabed and uh, the storm will come up. You know, uh, we throw buoys over the side and we have to break off drilling and we go into port. So the next day we come out, we can't find the damn pipe. And he said, so here's my proposition. I said, yes, sir. He says, if you'll put them where we tell you, I'd be willing to buy a few of those GPS satellites for you. <laughs> What do you think? I went, uh, I'm only a lieutenant commander. You have to talk to the program manager who, who was, who was uh, Don Henderson at that time. And of course he said no. But uh, so, I mean, the commercial guys were, they were all over it. And the, the pressure to declassify, de de encrypt the signal was, was just overwhelming. The pressure continued to remove the intentional accuracy degradation in the commercial signal and its use continued to expand. President Bill Clinton made the decision to remove the civilian accuracy restrictions, but even he could never have known the profound impact he had on the world. At 4 a.m. on the morning of May 2, 2000, the military precision became available to the world. The results were immediate and profound. Instead of a car knowing where it was on an overpass cloverleaf, it now knew which lane it was in. And the commercial signals are now operating to service approximately 4 billion users. Here are some of the graphs of before and after the 4 a.m. switchover. You know, GPS has become an international utility. And, and uh, people rely on it. And I think uh, Brad made an excellent case for that when he showed there was $65 billion worth of business and commerce that were relying on GPS as it is today. The equipment, which at that time was at least three racks of equipment in order to be, now you can get it in your phone. Back when we were building the first receivers, we were using very simple digital circuits because they didn't work at high clock rates. So we had stuff that was maybe running at 2 to 10 megahertz. Texas Instruments built their HDUE and their MANPAC using a technology where they hoped to be able to produce a 4 megahertz uh, microprocessor. 
they couldn't get it to work. So we had to settle for a pair of two megahertz. But think about your PC now, it's running at three gigahertz, 1500 times faster. Today in the cell phone, it's a little dollar and a half is the additional cost in a cell phone is all it is. <clears throat> in the beginning, those pieces of user equipment cost a quarter of a million dollars each. Now, they are one one hundred thousandth of that. The chip you have in your cell phone costs less than two dollars, has much more capability than anything that we ever had. I plotted the cheapest receivers available at any given time. The first data point on there is $219,000 for, uh, then the next one was 110,000, which was the TI-4100, then 40,000, which was the Trimble survey set. And now this was 10 years later. Stanford has these little independent labs or centers. And, and a lot of times it's interdisciplinary. You get a guy from AeroAstro and a guy from physics and a guy from the EE department. So we collectively formed a center, and, and the center um, was all different facets of what we call PNT, position, navigation, and time. In 1994, one of my brilliant students, Clark Cohen, um, came up with a system that demonstrated the first robotic commercial aircraft landings. FAA supported us on this. I'm very pleased with that. And we did 110 straight landings. And the accuracy of our measuring the airplane's location was down at the few inch level in three dimensions. The accuracy came at a cost of having quite a bit of infrastructure at the airport. And so uh, they went with something that wasn't quite as accurate, but was much easier to install because it, it could all be put within a very small footprint at each airport. And that's what became the loss system, which is what's approved and in use today around the world. Clark did his thesis before that on attitude. He had uh, very uh, he had uh, antennas on the wingtips, on the top of the fuselage, on the top of the tail. He came up with a very precise attitude. And then we discovered that, hey, with all this work going on with cars, with cheap inertial systems to detect crashes for airbags, if you take those cheap things, add GPS, you can get the attitude of an airplane with one antenna, one GPS antenna. And that system ended up being sold to Garmin. There are 20,000 little airplanes out there and they have a glass panel and the pitch roll and yaw are all coming from that system, very, very uh, affordable because GPS is aiding those cheap inertials from the automotive industry. WASP takes, in the U.S., we have 38 uh, reference stations, actually in North America, because there's ones in Canada and in Mexico, and those reference stations uh, to look at the satellites and determine what the orbital error is, what the clock error is, and they also come up with an ionospheric model. And they broadcast those corrections, and then you, the aircraft puts all that information together specific for their location. So rather than having something that's just valid at a single airport, it's valid across all of North America. And that way they can serve, right now they have 4,000 approaches defined under SBAS. And, and to put an approach, like at Half Moon Bay, you don't need any equipment there. You just say, okay, I need to know the survey, I need to know the location of the runway. And without putting, investing any more infrastructure, you now have an approach you know, at any, any runway. And their intent is to go to over 6,000 approach to basically any runway, you know, be it a grass field, be it, you know, whatever, they want to have you, any air pilot have the ability to have a stabilized approach into that rather than, you know, whatever, whatever they're using now. The uh, ILS that all the pilots are using routinely now in, in airplanes, um, the WAS system has been used as the source of truth for the flight inspection airplanes that go around and check all those old style systems. With this uh, GPS uh, version of the, the radar system, which is where the airplane uh, gets its own position by GPS, that is more accurate than radar, and therefore you can um, have a higher capacity of your airspace. And so it's a fundamental improvement. And it's also uh, cheaper than putting radar and covering every little valley with a radar. Uh, it solves that problem, it makes the airspace um, 
uh, be able to handle uh, a higher capacity. And so uh, it's a huge advantage to go to this new system compared to radar. One of the favorites is farm tractors. We pioneered farm tractors at Stanford. We did the first ones. John Deere gave us some money and humongous tractors. And we demonstrated the ability to go down a row towing a, a, a big ripper that tears up the soil and do that within an accuracy of about three or four inches. At least a factor of two or three better than the best driver they'd ever seen. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, this system that the civilians and the military depend on is operated by about five young people, men and women, captains and enlisted men, average age probably 26, and they are the heart of the system of today. And day in, day out, that reliability the 99.99% dependability that goes with GPS is a credit to them. What in the computer business from the 70s do people rave about today? And it's GPS. The ultimate measure of success, I think, is we're taken for granted. People now think that Everyone knows where they are. Well, they have to go back 50 years, and they didn't. We all had this vision that it was going to be a big thing, and uh, we'd all worked on military systems, and, uh, and we knew that this one was going to be big because uh, it was gonna be open to the world. In a relatively short period of time, 40-some months, we could go from a piece of paper to satellites up in the air, and many of the aerospace programs stretch on beyond somebody's career, which is okay, but this makes it very, very rewarding to see that occur. That over the 40 years, the thing that's most impressive is how it's permeated almost every feature in life, from finding McDonald's or a gas station, an ATM, to forming a field, to uh, rescues. Well, back in the day, if you ever heard like a news article or even just a little blurb, blurb in uh, Aviation Week. They mentioned GPS, they mentioned GPS. It was like, oh, whoa, and everybody would copy it and send it around. Look, GPS is in print. And nowadays it's like, whew, everywhere. It's really amazing when you think about it, right? How this thing started. We knew it had intrinsic value. And once you have it, something that's a novelty becomes a necessity after a while, doesn't it? The very first time we had a NAV solution, this is right after I got out there. We we're all kind of looking at this solution uh, coming off on it and going like, oh, this is going to be better than sliced bread. And somebody made the comment that I can see Sears and Roebuck selling these navigators, you know, 20 years down the road. Uh, well, my retirement kind of gag gift, I think Darwin put this together, was a Casio watch with a little antenna on it. And it said the GPS man pack of 19... 99, I think. Well, I have a GPS and a GLONASS in my watch right now. It's amazing how far it's come. The ranging accuracy today is about two feet. The signal in space accuracy is about two feet. And if I use special techniques, I have a millimeter or better of three-dimensional accuracy. Phenomenal what you can do with it. I was looked upon uh, as somebody in the Air Force, in effect, even though I was not in the Air Force. I was a contractor, but I was treated, treated as a, as a uh, member of the Air Force team. And I really appreciate that. I think maybe just some fundamental, very general ideas of what the system would look like were decided in the Lonely Halls meeting because the Air Force was given responsibility and they took it and ran. There is a sundial made out of black granite in front of the train station in Los Angeles. And it has three little phrases on it that absolutely represented what we were. The first was the vision to see. We could see what this could become. 
And that was essential. But you also had to have the faith, that's the second phrase, the faith to believe that we could really pull it off. And lastly, courage to do, the third phrase. We had to throw ourselves 110% into this. And I had people that were doing even more than that. The reason that it was a success was the program office, especially the Air Force, was very smart. Brad really, well Brad's very smart of course, but the thing is that he hired into his program office Air Force officers who were all very smart. And that really helps. Remember back when it was easy to get lost and fold a map, gas up, go where the lines cross. Makes me laugh to think how times have changed. In no way did we imagine what it's doing today. Who'd have known the big dreams that we chase? Odds were stacked, but hey, we did okay. The beaten path was never our way anyway. The world was ours to navigate. Dear old friend, I miss you. I wish you were here. It changed the way people do business, uh, you know, every day. If I could choose, I'd choose you again. Dream team of the very best of friends. Wouldn't change where we come from or where we've been. Together on this road until the end. From obscurity to ubiquity. Amazing, incredible. Dear old friend, I miss you. I wish you were here. I think the biggest thing, that was a hard working people. Uh, it was a great team. And you make the mission, the real goal of the team, then uh, really good things happen. Dear old friend, I miss you, I wish you were here. Thanks so much for your contributions to the country, very importantly, uh, and to technology itself. Mm -hmm.